Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Um, we are going to be having our keynote session tonight on Friedrich's ataxia. My name is Kayla White, and I'm a community education specialist at MDA. We're thrilled to have you join us today for this webinar. This learning series is part of our larger MDA community education programming, which focus on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and resources. Be sure to visit the community education section on mda.org for updates on upcoming events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the website for on-demand viewing at a later date. Please know that all phone lines have been muted, but we will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You can use the chat feature to type in your questions and feel free to send those in as you think of them. They'll be addressed after the presentation. I would also like to thank our webinar supporter, Riata Pharmaceuticals. We would not be able to provide community education webinars like this if not for their generous support, and we are very thankful and appreciative. For over 70 years, MDA has led the way in accelerating research, advancing care, and advocating for the support of our families. MDA's mission is to empower people living with muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases to live longer, more independent lives. Our mission comes to life through these, first, these four pillars. First, care. Through our national network of MDA care centers across the U.S., we support individuals and families from day one of their journey. Second, champion. Through our advocacy and education efforts, we empower families with information and resources. Third, catalyst. Through our investments in research, we are furthering advancements in treatment discoveries. And fourth, community. Through programs like summer camp, our connections program, and our community events, we are helping individuals and families build supportive connections and relationships. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to join the MDA community by registering with us. I would now like to introduce today's guest, Dr. David Lynch. We're so excited to have him here today. Dr. Lynch maintains a dynamic program focused on the rare disease Friedrich's ataxia. More specifically, the research led by Dr. Lynch spans clinical, translational, and basic science research efforts on FA that include conducting double-blind clinical trials, identifying biomarkers, and leading mechanistic studies in animal and cellular models of FA. The research conducted by Dr. Lynch and his lab team have led to a greater understanding of the metabolic dysfunction underlying FA. Their work has led to the creation of a patient database, as well as a pipeline of more than 20 drug candidates that represent potential new therapies. Dr. Lynch is currently working with pharmaceutical industry partners to develop drug candidates, as well as biomarkers for FA. We're so excited to have you here today, Dr. Lynch. I'll now turn the time over to you. Thank you very much, Kayla. I appreciate that lovely introduction, as well as the chance for the MDA to speak today. So now we'll go through the hardest part of this is to have me share my screen successfully. And let's see if I can do this here and then go down here to move it into presentation mode. And can you see that yet or no? Nope, not yet. Okay, I have to hit the sh okay, I have to hit share and then go down here and hit. Perfect. Now you see it. Perfect. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit on the background in Friedrich Ataxia, as well as some of the new developments within the field. Uh, I have a tendency to speak a little bit too fast. Consequently, uh, I will do my best to slow down. And I know we have a very diverse audience today, so hopefully, uh, we'll uh, I'll speak in a, in a way which everyone can understand. And if you have questions, feel free to answer them at the end of the era or contact me afterward. I'm happy to answer them uh, by email or anyway later. Oops, so now let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay, so Friedrich ataxia, let me move this window, is a rare progressive neurodegenerative disease affecting about one in every 50,000 people in the United States or up to one in every 100,000. So about four to 5,000 people in the United States and perhaps 15 to 20,000 people worldwide. The presentation always involves neurological dysfunction. Everyone has neurological troubles. However, it's really a multi-system disease. It involves the nervous system, the heart, orthopedic issues like scoliosis, endocrine issues like bone growth and diabetes, audiological features, ophthalmic features, including vision loss and uh, fixation difficulties, and finally fatigue. Fatigue being really a multi-system symptom in itself. So it really is involved in all these different things. Let 
And why doesn't this want to turn? There we are. Not everyone is the same in Friedreich ataxia. Moves backward. There's genotypic and phenotypic heterogeneity. Chandra's onset is most common, usually between the ages of five and 15, although rarely actually as young as five, usually about seven is the earliest we tend to see people. And if you have it present in childhood, the progression can be relatively rapid, typically involving progression to a wheelchair over the course of 10 to 15 years. And by the late teens, early 20s, most people require assistance for their activities of daily living. In contrast, later onset FA, and it's really a continuum, people presenting at all ages of life, but late onset, which is defined as being diagnosed or presenting after age 25, is associated with a slower progression and a milder overall phenotype. Clinical features in the nervous system, which is, I'm a neurologist, I'm gonna talk about that more than anything else, don't just happen everywhere. This is a very specific set of neurological features. What actually goes on? There's some particular neurons in the body called the large sensory neurons, which control what we call proprioception, knowing where your body is in space. That's obviously very important for balance because if you don't know where your body is, you're always gonna be off balance. You also lose some of the motor pathways, the pathways which start up at the top of the brain and project all the way down into the spinal cord to control uh, muscle tone and muscle strength. This tends to be incomplete. People are never completely paralyzed in FA, and it tends to be more prominent later in the disease. And that's why you see over the course of time in FA, a development of a stiffness and a weakness. What people talk about the most in the central nervous system is loss of that back portion of the brain, which I'm trying to circle here if it's coming through, called the cerebellum. The cerebellum is concerned basically with coordination as it gets affected, and there are probably two different locations there that get affected. You have difficulties with balance, not weakness, but simply balance. Now, speech itself has a balance to it, so you have speech difficulties, and you'll have limb coordination issues. This is the primary thing we think about with Friedreich ataxia in the nervous system, but in fact, there are other things, including, as I mentioned, the motor pathways and the sensory neurons. You also have a very unusual issue where you have difficulty localizing sound through a very specific portion of the brainstem, where a person hears and actually usually hears normally, but they can't figure out where the sound is coming from, which can in fact be very disabling. They'll be in a large group and they won't know who's speaking. In a crowded movie theater, in a crowded restaurant, things can be very uh, confusing. What is understated in FA as well is the loss of a very specific part of the retina. And remember, the retina is actually part of the brain. It's the retinal cells that project into the brain that uh, provide the visual information of the brain. This happens most in people who present early in Friedreich ataxia and it tends to happen later in the disease as people reach age 30 or so. It happens to some degree in everyone. But this is an area which is underappreciated and is actually one of the targets of many of some of our clinical trials at this point. There's also a little bit of muscle dysfunction. People's muscle does not degenerate, it does not go away, but doesn't work right. So people can have some weakness. There are overall very few to modest changes in cognition. People think normally. Thus, people with FA hold jobs, go to college, get married, and can do lots and lots of different things because their cognition is not affected. People remain smart throughout the course of their free drug ataxia. And perhaps when you look at this, you see that while there are a lot of very crucial areas of the brain that are affected, the overall number of neurons is not that large. So MRI scans, when you get them clinically early in the disease, are typically read as normal. They may not be quite normal if you really know how to look at them in detail, but they're frequently led as normal. So that's one of the most important things about FA is there are very key neurons we have to work on, but it's not all of the neurons in the body. I mentioned that it is a multi-system disorder. Uh, you have heart issues, the one we call cardiomyopathy. Essentially, this is decreased function of the heart. It can be stiff, it cannot pump, but these things can give rise to difficulties, uh, particularly late in the course of the illness. In addition, when you have abnormal cardiac tissue, it can give rise to funny heart rhythms called arrhythmias. Usually these come from the atria of the heart, not the ventricular portion. Things like atrial fibrillation, which we'll hear about on TV, these are uh, rhythms which can be managed. So it's important to maintain a relationship with a cardiologist if you're a person who has those arrhythmias. Uh, Endocrine issues are part of Friedrich ataxia. 
about 10 to 20 percent of people with FA have diabetes, a mixture of type one people presenting in childhood and not making enough insulin, as well as people presenting later developing typical type 2 disease, usually from insulin resistance. So we sometimes refer to it as type 1.5. Uh, it requires management of both such issues, and it can be well managed in FA. We know a fair amount about it. In addition, people have skeletal abnormalities. People have scoliosis, particularly those who present in early in life. And as uh, goes forward, about 25% of people will have to have corrective surgery almost exclusively those who we meet for the first time before age 10. Another thing, which is a skeletal, I don't want to call it an abnormality, I want to call it an anomaly, a variant, is called pest cavus, high arched feet. That doesn't usually cause really any disability, but it's a marker of what's going on in the brain probably. So it's something that people note. Do not think of it as a, a cause of disability. Think of the underlying neurological issues as the cause of disability. And then fatigue. Almost everyone feels tired all the time. They just can't get the energy up to do things. This is a big effect on people's quality of life. And it's one of the most important things for us to concentrate on as we move forward in trying to help people out with free brachytaxia. On September 19th, uh, 2023, I have to remember what year it is. There is symptomatic treatment for a few issues in FA, neuropathic pain being treated by gabapentin, uh, spasticity and stiffness being treated by agents such as baclofen. But more importantly, there are ongoing clinical trials to really get to the consequences of free drug ataxia and to prevent the downstream, to work on the downstream pathways and the consequences of the original mutation. This leads us to the new drug, Omaviloxolone, uh, called Skyclerif uh, commercially, I will refer to as Omaviloxolone or Omav because I use generic names, which has just been approved. We'll talk a lot more about it later. But realize that it's not a cure, and there is ongoing research on more therapies, things which actually try and replace the missing protein for taxin so that we get to more curative aspects rather than temporizing aspects. Another important part of treatment in FA is uh, just ev annual evaluation supportive treatment because having free brachytaxia does not protect you from other things. We have to be sure we treat those as they come up in order to optimize function. So people should be getting an annual echocardiogram and EKG from the uh, general practitioner cardiologist, looking at glucose and hemoglobin A1Cs to see if they're diabetic, screening for scoliosis in younger individuals. Once you get to be your adult height, age 16 to 18, usually scoliosis uh, doesn't have to be watched as closely. Vision and hearing screening to optimize people abilities, people's abilities. And finally, rehabilitation care is an important part of FA because the more you do, the more you do. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy are important for keeping people working at their maximum. So I do have to do this awful thing called explain a little basic science. So what is the genetic basis of free brachytaxia? Most mutations and diseases can be thought of as misspelling. And remember, this is a recessive disease. A person has to have two mutations, one on each copy of the gene in order to get disease. Now in FA, the most common mutation, 96% of all alleles, is not a simple misspelling. It's not a simple change in one piece of DNA, in one base. It's the naturally occurring GAA repeat, which occurs between the first and second exons of the first axon gene, goes from short to long. Normal numbers are less than 30. One would cause disease are 100 to 1500 GAAs, and we call that the triplet repeat link. It's not a simple misspelling, it's a lengthening of this that gives rise. It's relatively stable from generation to generation, but it does, it, uh, it's the getting longer which happened long ago which causes most of the disease. Uh, uh, as it gets, lo the longer it gets, or the longer it is, that, uh, gives rise to uh, worsening disease. A long GAA gives rise to more disease. And this will explain some of the variability as uh, in terms of why uh, people have more or less uh, uh, dysfunction. Uh, and I'll go to the next slide here. In some people, about 4% of people, uh, 
uh, at four percent of people, they have instead a point mutation, a single base change which substitutes for the J repeat length. So some people won't have two J repeats. As I look at the genetic test, I only have one. Uh, what will need to occur is that uh, what needs to occur in those is that a special type of genetic testing. Everyone has at least one GA repeat link, except a, a single person in Turkey who I'm not going to talk about today. Now, this is what I get to. The, the length of the GA repeat shown here on the x-axis correlates with the age and onset. So age and onset is a measure of how severe the disease is. You see some people presenting as late as age 40 or 50, and the number of GAAs correlates that. The longer the GA repeat length, the earlier the age of onset. Thus, that can be used as a marker of disease severity. In fact, the age of onset is a better marker of disease severity than the GA repeat length. There are three reasons that people vary a little bit. There's variation between tissues. There are other genes that influence the GA repeat uh, length. And sometimes the age of onset is it's looked at retrospectively, so it's not always a really good marker. So what do these mutations, these expansions in uh, the Frataxin gene do? What they do is that there's a protein made from that gene, which is called Frataxin. And what you can see here, taken from my friend Sanjay Bidi Tandani, is that uh, the, it, it doesn't make any RNA. Remember, your gene makes RNA, which makes protein. Essentially, that gene is silent, so you don't make any RNA. If you look on this Western blot over here, uh, I'm trying to get rid of this here. You see that the uh, for the amount of protein detected here with this dark signal called uh, looking at the protein is decreased. So people don't make as much protaxin. As a result, they have certain difficulties in their cells. They don't make any abnormal protaxin, and everyone makes some carriers. The parents of people with free bracket taxi make about 50% of normal, and they are stone cold normal. So you really have to lose a lot of protection, probably 95% before you're actually getting disease. People who have the two point mutations also are almost identical to people with two repeat links, so we know that it's actually the protein that is causing the issues. What does Frataxin do? Well, this is a diagram if you have a biochemistry text, and you can see that I copied this from a text. If you look on the back of the page here and see that there are certain words on the back, if you look very closely, is Frataxin goes to the mitochondria, the place where we all, all make energy. As a result, people with free brachytaxia don't make enough energy in their cells. Uh, it's important in uh, iron metabolism in the mitochondria, and that's part of it, but the, really the way to think about it is the lack of energy production. What really happens in free ataxia? Well, people have mutations in the, their FX gene, which gives rise to a lack of production uh, for taxin. This leads to trouble making energy and trouble with the, uh, part of the energy production of their mitochondria. And then we wave our hands here. There is selective mitochondrial dysfunction that leads to clinical manifestations, including neurological features. We don't know as much about this part. And that's where a lot of the research is ongoing right now. Uh, so why don't we just make a drug to make more uh, energy? It's not quite that easy, because even if we make a drug and prove it in scientific and basic science studies, we still have to know who to test it in. We have to know who's changing, so those are the ideal people. We need to know when to try it, and we need to know what the potential risks are. Now, these are things which are very hard to do without knowing anything about the population of people with FA. And that's where fortunately the support of a variety of groups, uh, the FDA, the Frederick Attack Research Alliance, and in the early stages of the FDA, uh, the MDA, we're able to come up with a natural history study where we have been following people for a long period of time. Uh, so uh, before I and before I go to that, I want to remind that if you think about feedback ataxia, there are two concepts behind making new drugs. One is to make the mitochondria function better, either make them more energy, make more energy, or to get rid of toxic free radicals, or improve the body's endogenous protection mechanisms, or have them make more mitochondria. Another thing that could be tried uh, is to have them make more frataxin, turn the gene back on. We call this epigenetic. We could also increase the amount the gene uh, makes by other means, 
by giving a uh, putting a new frataxin gene, or simply sometimes having people inject frataxin in, which has been engineered so it can get into cells in the appropriate way. The final thing we can do, and this is what's being looked at in a few labs around the world, but is not yet available for people, is to actually correct the mutation, get rid of that GAA repeat. So those are various new ideas for treatments. So the, I mentioned that in order to help move this forward, we have a large natural history study called FACOMS, the Free Drug Taxi Clinical Outcome Manager, sometimes called the Clinical Research Network and Free Drug Taxi. We've been collecting data for 20 years, following up to 1,500 people in the United States, Canada, and Australia. This has given us a roadmap of what free drug ataxy is like. Associated with it, we collect a few other things uh, to look for other genes that influence it, to look for markers in the blood and in uh, cells and in muscle, to look at RNA levels which change with the disease. We've received support from FARA, the MDA, and the FDA. It's been a very successful study, giving rise to a lot of publications, but it really attracts the pharmaceutical companies because we give them a roadmap of what's happening in FA and what might be uh, so that they can know how to treat people, when to treat people, and how to measure that change. So I know Jennifer Farmer will be talking on Thursday night about research, and she'll talk a lot about this and how to participate. We've actually now fused this study with an analogous study from Europe in a study uh, which we call UNIFI, which will be what it is going forward. One of the things we've been able to figure out, we've been able to precise, uh, determine really precisely how long we expect people to go before uh, needing a wheelchair. We can use that as an index of how they're doing. And in the early onset people, that's the group here in the blue, the later middle onset is in the lighter blue and the lightest blue is the later onset. It was 16.4 year, years is one of the things we were able to determine. We've also determined some things about clinical treatment based on what we've learned from the natural history study. One thing we learned, people with free radical ataxia are smaller than average. Uh, they're at the 42nd percentile of the general population. Uh, uh, so, in fact, we know that people, uh, uh, this smallness or loss of size is mainly in height, somewhat in BMI. Once you get to puberty, we know this increases, so people actually catch up. That's partly because older individuals have shorter repeats, uh, so if they're a slightly different group. Older people tend to be less active, so they gain a little weight. And the other thing is that all of us, me included, gain weight as we go through time. Uh, this is a normal thing which actually protects us as we age. Uh, so we know that people actually catch up uh, over time uh, in weight. The lower BMI uh, does reflect, uh, it does parallel neurological dysfunction. People who are smaller tend to have worse neurological function, but it doesn't mean that the smallness gives rise to a change in neurological function. It's probably one shared event which is causing both of them. So just feeding more or force feeding isn't gonna help. People eat what they need to eat. There probably is an ideal FA diet out there. We're just not smart enough yet to know what it is, although I think we're making real strides on that. Another thing we have learned from the group is that in FA, people discovered that if when you lack for taxin, iron accumulates in the mitochondria. Some people thought that this was a good idea to avoid iron, and if you take away the iron, it actually improves the cardiac status to some degree. But what we've learned from the natural history studies is that people are actually anemic. People are actually depleted of iron in part of their cells. So in fact, one of the important things is to be able to treat the anemia when it occurs and don't be scared about over accumulating iron. I didn't say go out and take iron just for the sake of doing it, but we haven't found those adverse events that we're worried about. And in fact, iron is an okay thing in Friedreich ataxia. It may not work long time because in fact, people are just gonna spit it right back out, but uh, it's uh, something which is not as worrisome as we thought. So these are things we've learned clinically from the natural history study in addition to bringing forward research. So there's some new considerations that we've learned now as we're developing new treatment. Should we treat people earlier? Well, ideally, once we have a medicine, uh, we should do that. So there's some things to protect you talk about. I think many people know that it takes a while to be diagnosed. Could we shorten that diagnostic journey and we, could we uh, carry out predictive testing to find out people earlier? 
So this is from a study that Farrah did a couple years ago. And what they looked at is what the initial symptom was and what where should we be looking for people with FA. Not surprisingly, in almost all age groups, less than 10 to 19 and older than 20, uh, it's ataxia. In the less than 10 group, there are a few people who present with heart disease, a lot of people who present with other, and a few people who present with scoliosis. As actually goes to teenage years, heart disease gets less and scoliosis becomes a thing which is monitored. And when you get to adults, it's almost all ataxia because the other parts are not as of the disease are not as prominent in later onset individuals. Another interesting thing is how long it actually takes people to get diagnosed. So the blue here is the people who presented later older than 20. The red group is the people who presented under age 10. And the 39% is the major group between ages 10 to 19. What you see is that the uh, group who present youngest actually have the shortest time to being diagnosed. And the people who present latest have the longest time. So what that would appear to be telling us is what's really identifies people for physicians and to each other that a person has a disease is how fast you're changing. How fast is your balance getting worse? Not the actual status. That's why it's hardest in adults and in some ways easiest in children. It's 2.3 years, a good amount of time. I think it's a little long. It's a little hard sometimes because there are clumsy people in the world and in pediatrics, the whole concept is you don't make diagnoses if you don't need to. We need probably as the uh, treatment come forward to put more pressure on to identifying people earlier. Uh, one, and in fact, the other interesting thing is that 30% of people are actually misdiagnosed in their first medical diagnosis. Most, uh, it's more common in the younger individuals, and the most common thing they're diagnosed with is shark and tooth, inherited neuropathy, sometimes cerebral palsy. In the adults, I'll mention it's multiple sclerosis that they're usually diagnosed with because that's the thing which looks closely to. So there is a lot of room for improvement in the early uh, features of the disease. Uh, another question is siblings. When we see two people in the same family, uh, they show up at the same age. Of those 55 people at top, most of the people presented very similar in age. Only 10 of those siblings uh, presented five or more years apart, and 15 were three to four years apart, 30 within two years. So when siblings show up, they usually show up at the same age. So that means there's a time when you can be pretty sure that a person who hasn't been genetically tested doesn't have FA, but it's hard to be 100% certain if they've gotten over a certain age. One of the things which you can do now genetically is you can test people before they have symptoms. This is a ethical discussion that has lots of landmines in it, but one of the key aspects is, is Friedreich ataxia treatable? If it's untreatable, the question becomes why, because you're gonna change your life forever if you're tested and are positive. And whether that's a good thing is not, not certain. But is it untreatable? What constitutes treatment? Many people take the vitamin coenzyme Q. That probably is slightly beneficial. Is that a treatment? Can we find people earlier with heart disease and thus prevent them from having complications? Is that a treatment? That's an interesting question. Is there uh, a uh, is there also a nutritional therapy that we can use? Is there an off-label treatment, something which is available from another disease that would uh, might help FA? Does that mean we should go testing people early? And finally, that gets us to the question of omoviloxone, which is approved for people 16 and older, but it's not yet a treatment for people under the age of 16. Is that a reason to do predictive testing? Well, and perhaps the possibility that there will be an omoviloxone trial in children to try and get the drug into that age group. Is that a reason to... Uh, go there? I would say potentially so. But I tell everyone in the audience, be careful where you go. Because once you go down the genetic testing, you can't go back. I was given this story about a year and a half ago now, a 14-month-old evaluated for developmental delay. And in the end, I don't even think they had developmental delay. All the usual things were negative, the simple things, uh, treatable items. So they went to a test called holoxone sequencing, which now can sometimes pick up the free record taxi repeats. And they actually found that this 14-month-old had free record taxi.
they confirmed it by direct testing. And he got the privilege of going to see some cardiologists, get some spine films done in 18 months, got started on coenzyme Q. The only problem, the second repeat length was so short that that person is predicted to show up at a neurologist at age 40. So have we done a good thing here? That's an interesting question. I'm not gonna take a position, but I would like people to think before they go into the predictive testing world. Which brings us to why do we talk about uh, predictive testing? Ohm of aloxalone, ohm after sure. This is a small organic molecule from Rauder Pharmaceutical. It's basically safe. There have been lots of phase one studies done in normal individuals and a couple other diseases, and it does not have a lot of side effects. Uh, I will mention since its release recently, that's basically true. Uh, it appears that, that continues to be true. What it does is it keeps a certain protein called NRF2 around. NRF2 controls the body's response to mitochondrial disease. It makes you do better if you have a mitochondrial disease. For some reason, this is turned off in Friedreich ataxia. As a result, you could theoretically give OMAV and people would uh, deal with their Friedreich ataxia better. They'd restore some of the missing processes and they should get better perhaps and perhaps stabilize. I mentioned this slide here. I mentioned there was very little data in animals before they decided to give it to people because it was a safe drug in other diseases. So if you look for a lot of studies, does it do anything in mice? You will find that there is no answer because it was never done. It works in some of the cells in a dish, which people gave us the natural history study. And it's safe. That's what brought it forward. So uh, it went forward with, in some ways, a simpler approach than we'll see other drugs uh, do. Don't you can ask me at the end how long it took, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. A pivotal study, and this is the way we prove drugs work. A double-blind, placebo-controlled, worldwide, randomized trial. 100 people, uh, 40, actually, uh, really 80 people, 40 people on drug, 40 people on placebo. People had a score where I mentioned here 20 to 80 on their exam that someone early in the disease to someone late in the disease. Everyone was between ages 16 to 40 because that's where safety data was available. Half the people, that means randomized one-to-one -one, get drug, half get placebo for 48 weeks, essentially one year. We looked only at people who don't have large feet. Uh, we can talk about that later if you like. The primary endpoint, what we use to prove it works, is what does their exam score look like? Did they do better, worse, or the same? Not complicated. This is the data. This graph shows on the excess study week. This is over time. White is the placebo group. This light blue is the drug group. Down is good. We started a baseline of zero. People get better over the first 12 weeks. The placebo group gets a little better. That's what happens in uh, all studies. Drug group gets better and stays better. So the maximum benefit is out nine to nine to 12 months. Thus, this is one drug do better at essentially one year. How much is this difference? between the placebo group and the people on drug. The difference between the group is about 2.5 points. What is that? That's the amount a person would be expected to progress over the course of about two years. So you could say that people got about one and a half years better from where they started, and they're about two to two and a half points better than they would have been the placebo arm. That was statistically significant work, basically. Uh, does it last? Yes, it does. So here we did a different experiment where we actually compared the, after that 48 week point, everyone gets drug. That's one of the enticements to bring people and to get more safety data. Everyone goes on drug. This group in the blue are the people in the study. And this starts at the 48 week moment. So this gets rid of the improvement of the first year. You look at it, people on drug progress a little bit. People who were matched to those individuals in the study from our, uh, who came from our natural history study, 
worsen uh, about 60% more. So people on drug did better again throughout the three years. This difference here at three years is bigger than the difference at two years, which is bigger than the difference at one year. And they started at the same spot. Thus, at year three, which is four years total, people on OMAV are still getting better than untreated individual when compared to natural history data. This was actually the tipping point of data which brought the FDA over to approval. So this comes directly from our natural history study. So as you hear about these studies, that's why it's worth participating because it does lead to development of therapies. Uh, so the last day the FDA could decide was on the 28th of February of this year. They let the announcement out at 4.35 in the afternoon. Uh, I think I was riding my exercise bike at the time. It's a moment I won't forget. Uh, it was approved for all as beneficial therapy for all FA patients in the United States who are age 16 or older. That's actually a broader approvement, uh, approval than in the study. It's broader in that it included everyone above the age of 40. They saw no need to differentiate there because the rationale is it worked in people of that age would continue to work in such individuals. Uh, there were very few adverse events. That's part of the reason it gets approved. The data is good. The data is very good in many individuals, but the fact that it's basically safe helps get you to across the finish line. There's the concept of regulatory flexibility. You don't have to be perfect in degenerative disease. You have to be good enough, and this was deemed good enough. Now, there is one thing which I glossed over a little bit, is that the dosing is very specific. One of the unusual things about OMAV is if you cut the dose in half, you get rid of about half the benefit. You still see benefit, but it's only half as much. If you double the dose, the benefit goes away. So that's why it's very important to be on the right dose. If my good friends at Riata had not done a very detailed dosing study in FA that I did not show you, we would have missed the correct dose. What does that mean? It means you have to be safe moving forward. And there are various other drugs that influence the what the dose of OMAP should be. For example, uh, Paxlovid, the COVID drug, makes you have to cut your dose uh, in half for at least the time you're on it. So these are some of the complicated issues about it, but they're very manageable. At this point, it's not available in other countries. Uh, presentations are being made to other countries at this point to help it get approved there. I think I would anticipate in the tangible future in other countries it will be approved, but it's not available yet. It is not approved for children. Uh, now it is priced at roughly 370 thousand dollars per year so it's not likely that uh your doctors or your insurance company will approve of using so-called off-label without it directly being approved for children uh there that's sort of a financial political aspect but there are reasons not to do that if safety is unknown uh do i think it's unsafe in children no but we simply don't know and you may find things as you go younger that you have not seen before. But I think the biggest issue is the dosing is not known. Uh, they have not systematically assessed the dose to look at how fast it turns over. Uh, and as a result, a person who's taking the adult dose may be above or below what they need to take. Thus, I don't think it's, I think in many individuals, it will not be effective unless we do the required dosing study. I would speculate that that is in the planning, and I know we'll have lots of participants wanting to go forward as soon as uh, we're able to get that event planned. The drug OMAV wasn't available for about four months after its approval due to the impurity in the original uh, commercial batches. It is now physically available. Uh, we are getting it approved by insurance companies. Uh, there's a patient assistance program in place if a person's copay is too high. So I would have everyone ask their neurologist about it. 
because of this effect that it's, uh, it's the benefit is very indolent, it is very hard to know right away that it is beneficial. It's not like you snap your fingers and you're better. It builds up on you. You look back in time and notice, hey, I'm doing things better. So you won't immediately know if it's beneficial, but given that it's safe, you have to think of the question from the opposite way. Is there a reason I shouldn't be taking it? Adverse events, financial impropriety, or if you're really intolerant, or if you go a couple years on it and you see no change from your previous progression, then you may be one of those uh, few individuals who don't respond to it. Such individuals do exist as they go for all drugs. So give consideration to getting on it and talk about it with your neurologist. And if they don't understand the dosing, your neurologists are happy to contact me. So what are our conclusions right now? Well, uh, we finally have that available treatment, but this is not the end. This is the first step. We need to start looking at other agents that give frataxin to people, that put the frataxin gene back in, that correct the mutation, or that turn the gene back on like a dimmer switch. These are the things that we need to work on now, and there are companies developing these and even some reaching clinical trials at this point. We also need to extend OMAB to children, but we have to do the studies that uh, are required for that. I would ask everyone to look for those studies and consider participating if you are eligible. And then we need to think about these new treatments and how it affects other approaches to other as aspects of life, how one lives lives, but also particularly the aspect of predictive testing and the value in earlier diagnosis and decide whether that's something which is necessary or not. That's something that everyone can think about in the uniqueness of their own life because not everyone will have the same answer to those questions. So with that aside, I wanna emphasize the most important thing, which is uh, that we didn't get here by one person doing group. I list here only the people of my lab group uh, who have gotten together to help make things go, but I've had lots of collaborators through a year from people from Penn, Chop, Sanjay from Oklahoma, uh, Bill Gates spelled a different way from MRI scan, Jennifer Farmer from Fair, the Naparellas who are now, uh, who used to be at UAB and they're now in Dallas, Riata Pharmaceuticals, uh, the sponsor of study. So we've had lots of funding agencies and that's how we got here. And this picture uh, epitomizes the collaboration that is necessary to move forward. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite patients. She's now a senior in college. Oh my gosh, I'm old. Uh, this was when she was much younger at a social event with, this is the daughter of another famous FA researcher, I won't mention it. And this is of course, for those people who know my daughter. So, and they are all friends and all get together all the time whenever they have a chance to be in Philadelphia. So I'm going to stop there to give you a chance to ask a lot of questions because I suspect there are some on OMAV. And I wanna thank you again for giving me a chance to talk. All right, let's see. Let me get my screen shared so we can open up for some questions. Okay, and I'm um, very good. There you go. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Lynch. Um, we can now open the webinar to questions. Um, if for anybody in the audience may have, you can send your questions and using the chat feature. Um, while we wait to see if any come in, we did actually get a few beforehand and you did address some of these, but um, just in case we'll go over it again. Um, somebody asked, as a parent of a 10-year-old with FA, what is the expected timeline for pediatric trials? What can we in the community do to help the process? Uh, very good question. Uh, so the things one can do, so there have been pediatric studies in FA, and we are trying to move everything to that. Uh, PTC 743 just completed a pediatric study. Unfortunately, it did not have enough benefit to reach its endpoint there discussing with the FDA whether there's a path forward. Uh, it, again, is a safe drug, but the benefit uh, on its primary outcome measure was not there, so we'll see where the ruling comes. Uh, the things one can do. So let's suppose that, uh, I, mean, I, I will tell you, the dose of OMAD, for example, when a child is not published, uh, how do you know where to start? Well. To figure that out, they're going to have to start with a study where they give it to people for a very small amount for a very uh, short time. Uh, 
So you might see a study announced where to get one dose of drug. Now, one dose of drug isn't going to provide any benefit, uh, but it's a necessary precursor to doing the study where you with people will get benefit and benefit will get proven. Now, the extension of a drug from the adult world to the pediatric world sometimes requires another clinical trial where they show it's uh, proof again. Sometimes it's, it doesn't. Most epilepsy drugs right now, they'll be approved in adults. And then the mechanisms of epilepsy seizures are so common, they're so similar between uh, older children and young adults that all of the company will be asked for some safety data and some dosing data and not have to do efficacy studies. We don't know where this is going to go with uh, omeviloxone, but that would be a faster path forward. So if you see a response, a clinical trial, consider whether you want to participate in it. And if you do, most of the trials recruit by an email from FARA from their registry, where be signed up on the registry, get that email. The fastest response to one of those announcements we sent out, and the email will come out, hi, a trial is being carried out at these institutions. Call the institution if you want to participate. Uh, you'll get that email. The fastest response we've ever had was 28 seconds. We have a good problem in Friedrich Taxa. We were once asked to fill a study of 30 ambulatory children, which you would think that would be hard. We had 52 in two hours. So respond right away and also consider what it's going to take to be in a trial. They have different amount numbers of visits, and Jennifer will, Jen Farmer will go through this all probably on Thursday. If they have different numbers of visits, see that you know you can commit to be there, because one of the issues which sometimes comes up is people finding out they can't really do it. And I'll f say that some of the data from OMAV was compromised by an external force making the study hard, COVID which made the visits a lot different in structure and made it hard for people to travel. So think about those things, but participate in the studies as, you're, as they're announced. Realize that just because something isn't a clinical trial doesn't mean it, that it doesn't move the needle forward. There are other studies that we need to do in order to look for markers in early stage disease and things which when the FDA looks at a drug, it's not only that primary outcome, that thing which we judge to be better or worse, it's the whole package. It's the safety, it's the biomarkers, it's the things we call secondary outcomes. So studies of those things are just as important. So right now, the only trial that I know recruiting for uh, 10 year olds is Dr. McCormick's study of nicotinamide riboside at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is a so called two by two study. It has nicotinamide riboside as an intervention and a different intervention, exercise. You get randomized to either receiving drug or not, and exercise or not. If you get randomized to exercise, they send you home with a recumbent exercise bike. If you get randomized to what I like to call the couch potato arm, you get an exercise bike at the end of the study. One of my patients said you should get a couch, but <laughs> that's not in their protocol. So it's a good study. This would be something that they're looking to add on top of OMAP to make things a little bit more better, if that's an appropriate grammatical phrase. I think many of you know Kyle Bryant, who has spent his life demonstrating that exercise can help treat FA. So that's my speech on trials for young individuals. Thank young you. 64 and less, just for the record. Gotcha, thank you. Um, so we have had some questions come into the chat now. So somebody has asked, so if you see improvement, did you say you might continue to see improvement for up to two years? So, there are some people in this study whose exams are the same as they were five years ago, or even a little better because they had that first year of improvement. What you see from the graph is an average response where some people are continuing to improve uh, out to the two-year point. Uh, I'm not going to say that I remember anyone who improved beyond the two-year point. Some people are starting to progress. Everyone is a little different. There are some individuals who claim no benefit, and our exams didn't necessarily show benefit. Of those individuals, one individual, the people we work with said his speech got better. Another individual, he elected to go off medicine, and then he got worse, which means there's probably working for him, and he didn't know it. 
Because again, the benefit is indolent and all that. And there is one person who elected to go off drug and didn't get any worse. So I'm convinced that he was not being benefited by it. Whether we like it or not, we're all different and we all have different amounts of response. Absolutely, thank you. Um, somebody has asked um, if, when the drug is available, um, is do you know if it would be available for people who don't have insurance or if they're on social security or any advice on that? So the best way to figure this out is to apply. So it's, it is available now. You should have, you should get the prescription and then it's, it's a mail order only drug. So we work with a program set up called the Riata Reach program where they contact the insurance and then we discuss things with your insurance company. If you have no insurance, there's a patient assistance program that can take the cost down. How low? I will let my friends at Riata Reach, which is the uh, patient assistance program, tell you. It can go to a low number. If the copay is too high, there are ways uh, to try and get it down. I will not make statements on how much for any given individual, but you don't know unless you ask. And somebody actually did ask in the chat how much this would cost again. So that's something that each individual would need to reach out and. Each one individual would need to know. I know online people have talked about how they haven't been able to get it. We just reviewed this today. We have gotten greater than 80% of our people covered by insurance with co-pays, which are $75 or less per month. There are some people whose nominal copay was $7,000 a month. Then the patient assistance program has taken care of that in that person that I'm thinking of. We also have people whose insurance has a copay of $0. There are two places where pushback has become common. Because the study included fewer ambulatory, non-ambulatory individuals, uh, there is pushback on that because people who have higher speed didn't have as much response or been pushed back on that. We have successfully gotten it approved for individuals with both of those issues. So nothing is absolute. You make the argument and you go from there. And I'm getting better and better at arguing as I get older and older. Some of us have been good at it for a very long time. So. <laughs> All right, let's see. Somebody has asked. Does the GAA repeat number change or get higher with progression? So your uh, very good question. Uh, when we talk about it expanding, it expands as it goes through uh, germ cell differentiation. Uh, and it's even a little bit more complicated than that. Once a person has it, we do not believe it substantially expands. It uh, we have been able to measure this in conjunction with Merrick, and the projection is it gets 10 repeats worse over the course of a decade. So when you talk about a significant number being 100 to 1,500, it's not changing over the course of a person's life. Progression comes, so progression comes, and we don't believe for tax and levels change over the course of a lifetime. They stay the same, but what it is is that low number wears and wears on your tissue so that things keep getting worse and worse and more and more cells drop out over time, more and more processes are dysfunctional. So it's the cumulative event which gives rise to it, not a change in the molecular events. Gotcha, thank you. Um, let's see, somebody's asked, if a person is on Skyclaris, would you discontinue use for future trials? So the only reason you ethically should have to go off Skyclaris in another trial is if it has a drug interaction with whatever the medicine is being tested. Uh, drug interactions, it occurs with calcium channel blockers, a couple antidepressants, uh, some antibiotics, antifungal agents, uh, and Paxlovid, as well as CBD, St. John's wort, and grapefruit juice. So you're not allowed to drink grapefruit juice on OMF. If, tho if those were one of the conditions, you'd have to go off of Sky Claris, but that's, or you'd have to go off grapefruit juice. Uh, the only other reason is if Sky Claris did the same thing as the drug which was being tested. Almost everything in trials now is something which raises for taxing levels. There is no published data that says uh, uh, OMAV raises for taxing levels. So in my opinion, it would be unethical to design a study where people had to go off OMAP. They could ask you to stay on it 
during the course of a trial, so it's not a confounder, but they it would be hard to ask you to go off of it. Okay. Um, does having a lower repeat number tend to make the drug seem to work better? Uh, good question. The answer is there was a slight, if you look at the data published, there is a slightly increased benefit for people who have long GA repeat links. But it was not statistically significant that they were different. It was just, and it was, we didn't account for all the other variables. The people with long J repeat links tend to be younger. So maybe it was younger people responding better. Or maybe it was the people who had long J repeats were seen in a different phase of the moon. We didn't separate all those things out. So you can't really say. It, there were people in this study from repeat links in the 200s to repeat links in the 900s. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we got actually beforehand when somebody registered was, um, do you have more clarification as to why liver enzymes may elevate? I've read that as a sign that the drug is working. Oh, you've read the, the, the details. So it's, <laughs> it's not that liver enzymes go up. It's that all these enzymes called transaminases go up in every tissue in the body. It's just that they mainly come from the liver when we check them in the blood. The liver itself is not impacted in a negative manner. It still makes all the proteins it should. It still gets rid of blood cells with the process of making bilirubin. It's just that the enzymes go up because you're metabolically turning the body back on. Remember how I said people with FA are small. Their metabolism is low inherently. We are metabolically turning them back on, so it goes up. It's a time-limited process that goes uh, for one to two months and goes away. Uh, I, this is not liver toxicity. It's liver enzymes going up. And while everyone sits on the edge of their chair worrying that about the first person who gets true liver toxicity, not because that's ever happened, but because you always have to worry about things because things happen. I will expect that we will see new adverse events we didn't see in the study. Why? Because we're giving it to 10 times as many people. But so you did pick up the other thing, that there is a small tendency, and I don't think it's ever published, that the that liver enzymes as a marker of metabolism predict people who may respond better. That's a very small tendency. And I don't, I can't, don't officially know where you obtain that true fact from. Uh, but uh, so it is a predictor that you can respond to the drug. Now it's not a perfect correlation. So don't think because your liver enzymes went to 11 times normal, you're going to see 11 times the benefit. Uh, so, but you are correct. All right. Um, I think we have time. I, I saw one more question come in. Um, somebody in the chat has asked, non-ambulatory person will or will not see any benefit from the drug? In the study, people who were non-ambulatory actually had a higher average benefit than those who were ambulatory. So they will see benefit on average, but it won't be necessarily the same benefit because think of it as going back a year and a half in time on your neurologic exam, where if you start from a different point, you'll be doing different things. Think about it as taking on the things that are not yet irreversibly affected. So what you what the recovery you see may be different in character, and everyone's different. Everyone's different. That seems to be one of the key things in all of this is everybody's different, and everybody will respond differently. That is correct. Um. Oh, goodness, we did have a few more questions to just come in. Let's see Happy if we can get them. someone. Um, somebody has asked, what is the process of getting this drug? Um, do I start the process or does the doctor? Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? What you should do is you should talk to your doctor. It can be your neurologist. It could be your primary practitioner. It could be anyone who's willing to do it. And uh, say, hi, there's a new drug for free ataxia. Uh, this is... Uh, what you need to do to get me on it. And there is, uh, you can just look up Sky Claris online, and it'll take you to the website where you can download a form and send that off to the centralized pharmacy. 
uh, and then go from there. If there are physicians who don't understand about it, uh, I'm happy to talk to them by email or phone. If there are people who, uh, I've had a couple of doctors who were not comfortable prescribing until a person come to see me, I'm happy to see anyone. Uh, so, uh, or I'm happy to talk to your doctor, whatever you like. Perfect. Um, it looks like the last question that came in, somebody had asked, um, they said that their cholesterol has been going up every month and they take the medicine before blood work, but they're asking, should I not take it until after the blood work? So the cholesterol thing, uh, cholesterol does go up. Remember, high cholesterol is actually a subtle part of FA that we don't talk about. It's a little bit higher. And remember that there's at least one person on this webinar who takes medications for uh, high cholesterol, and it's not Kayla. Uh, so what I would, you don't care about whether it's before or after blood work. It's going up long term. It's not being, it's not going to matter before or after the medicine. And in fact, I hate to break something your doctors have told you, you don't need to fast to get an accurate cholesterol number. Uh, that only affects triglycerides. So you can get your cholesterol anytime. What you care about cholesterol for is not what it is today, not what it is tomorrow, but what it continuously is and whether it puts you at risk for vascular disease, which is a big part of being an American, let us say. Uh, uh, so if your cholesterol goes up, then there are various ways to treat that, including low cholesterol diet, increased exercise, uh, statins, and then there are even non-statin cholesterol lowering agents uh, out there. So that would be something to talk about with your doctor. If your cholesterol reached the, the trigger numbers, which keep getting lower because they keep wanting our cholesterol lower. All right. Um, so we, we have run out of time. Um, Dr. Lynch, we are so glad you're here with us tonight. Um, we sincerely appreciate your time, your expertise, Anytime. and everything you do for the, the neuromuscular community. We so appreciate you being here with us. Great. Thank you. I would also like to, again, thank our webinar supporter, Riata Pharmaceuticals. We would not be able to provide community education webinars like this if not for their dinner support, and we are very thankful and appreciative. If you are new to MDA and are diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease under MDA's umbrella or are a loved one of someone who is diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with MDA. You can do this by visiting mda.org slash join and completing a short form. Joining is free and we'll keep you up to date on the latest research, educational programs, and supports. We would love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, you can open your camera and point it at the QR code on the screen. That will pop up a web page with a short survey on the webinar. If you don't have a smartphone, that's okay. You'll get an email after um, the webinar with a link in the, that email. If you have any questions after the webinar, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow up with you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much for attending and we hope to see you tomorrow for a discussion about cardiac health and care guidelines. Thank you all. Have a good evening. That concludes the webinar. Thanks.